So in summary, what I want to do today uh, is, is take you through the beginnings of a sort of microhistorical focus uh, to understanding how um, a metropolitan uh, space like um, a 19th century, an early 19th century London public house um, relates to the kind of uh, wide colonial hinterlands of the early 19th century um, through consumption of commodities from it. Um, there's a, the principal piece of archiving question here uh, is a uh, bill book from a Marlborough public house dating to 1811. Um, uh, and I'll explore the relationship between the sort of commodities presented. Um, uh, what I want to do rather is, is explore the um, relationship between the commodities presented there uh, in that bill book um, and by proxy those consuming or using them. Um, and also explore the degree to which uh, those individuals um, consuming things in, in the public house at the time um, were able to understand the labour by which uh, those commodities were produced. Um, I think that's, that's the um, essential uh, thing in the study. Um, and what I'm trying to do here is to kind of address a, a lacuna in the study between the relationship of material culture present in the metropole, which has a an archaeologist and, and, and somebody working in, a, in an active archaeological organisation in London um, I'm very conscious of, and colonial exploitation. There's very little discussion in archaeological work of how tobacco pipes or sugar refining uh, materials excavated um, here in London, where I am on a very hot day, I think we're looking at a high of 32. Um, uh, so that how those um, how those objects excavated here relate directly to colonial exploitation elsewhere. Um, so, so that's what I'm trying to bring forward. So uh, commodities listed in the bill book include sugar, rum and tobacco, as well as mahogany and other kind of materials that, um, uh, that stem from empire. Um, and I want to understand the, uh, the, the, how consumers uh, kind of comprehend the, the origins of these products. Um, and whether or not they, there is any understanding of racial difference that might play within how those understandings are constructed. Um, and so before we do that, I did just want to have a bit of a think about why um, we might want to undertake um, uh, this kind of work. So studies of material culture and art history have, have dwelt extensively on the impact of new colonial commodities, such as tobacco, sugar, coffee, cotton or chocolate, on urban life and sociability in Europe. And in fact, the, um, the, the project that's brought together this conference is, is of course a prime example of that. Um, so uh, during the period 16 to 1800, commodities like this were increasingly consumed by a wider range of people in society. Um, and a growing body of scholarship does also address the material conditions in which such commodities were produced almost universally by enslaved and exploited labor in colonial settings. Um, thus far, however, I feel more attention could be given to recovering and understanding the interplay between these two sets of lives in the history of European colonialism, uh, particularly as they kind of manifest in their material remains. So the questions might be, how did those in European capitals like London uh, perceive the lives of the slaves who produced the cotton in which urbanites went on to fashion their own new identities, or the coffee that was the basis of new social spaces such as the coffee house? Um, or the rum that in, underpinned new practices of intoxication through recipes like punch. And to what extent uh, do these practices in fact serve to obscure the violence and exploitation of the way in which commodities like sugar, coffee, tea or cotton are produced? Um, how can we read these understandings from material and documentary evidence of these practices and spaces? So that's my first point. The second is that I think it's really um, imperative to see the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade and also the subsequent economic exploitation because it didn't stop with abolition um, in our present built environment of which pubs continue to form a really important and celebrated part. So taking that work of understanding the impact of the transatlantic slave trade beyond the historic house um, and doing the work uh, that I think Edward Said best described in um, uh, 1989 as forcing the European metropolis to think its history together with his emphasis, the history of the colonies awaken, awakening from the cool stupor and absurd immobility of imperial dominion. 
um, and that was published in uh, representing the colonized anthropologies interlocutors in critical inquiry. Um, and then next, I think uh, another thing that's really important in considering the public house is that sentimentality um, around the public house as a national institution, um, and in particular in Britain, its focus on national identity um, can be argued to have obscured some of the colonial con connections that the public house has, but these are essential to it. Um, and that, re that sentimental rhetoric around the public house has emerged really strongly um, in the pandemic. Um, and uh, those of you based in the UK will have uh, seen the various headlines in March 2020 when uh, the first lockdown prompted the closure of pubs um, uh, and, and uh, John, the, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson's discussion of what he calls the ancient inalienable right of freeborn people. Um, and that just set me thinking that there's an awful lot in there between inalienability and, uh, and the, the character of freebornness um, uh, that needs to be interrogated in the history of the pub if we're going, if, you know, if we're going to critically engage with statements like that. Um, and forgive me for I may, I, I fear it may not be the last time you hear that quote, this conference. Um, and then finally, I think there is, uh, there's something even more fundamental than that, which is that critically engaging with where within our quotidian experience exploitation manifests, or, you know, we benefit uh, from exploited labour of others, um, is a really important thing. So uh, there's evidence to suggest that consumption of fair trade goods went up uh, in the West by about 13% um, during the pandemic because um, it's assumed people had more time to think about the origins uh, of the products that they were buying. Um, in addition, you know, I might just ask you to look at the label in your t-shirt or your trainers um, and think about where uh, where those products are produced in relation to where you are now. Um, because I think this is the point at which the kind of subjugation in, in the early 19th century, um, particularly with abolition and the kind of legitimization of that economic model, um, it's the point at which uh, huge volumes of distance economies are uh, subjugated to service kind of diverse metropolitan ones in, here in Europe. And that phenomenon, you know, as I'm saying here, isn't new and also only becomes more complex. And as it becomes more complex, we will need uh, new, new tools to think about it that I think studies like this can provide. Excuse me. Um, OK, so uh, let's go back then to the archive. So the principal object that I've been looking at to date is this 51 page bill book. Um, and this uh, belonged to the proprietors of a pub named the Yorkshire Stingo uh, in Marylebone and dates to uh, the first six months of 1811. It provides a detailed record of the range and frequency of the supply of materials uh, to what was a quite famous public house in this period. Um, uh, this bill book is now held in the City of Westminster Archive uh, and it uh, con contains approximately 360 bills uh, from 35 suppliers, including brewers, tobacconists, house painters, and sign writers, pasted into a saddle stitched book of rag paper in date order, um, which I'm approximately 50% of the way through transcribing from photographs. And in that sense, maybe another lockdown is just what I need to get the thing finished. Um, uh, and so uh, we'll get a bit further into the detail in a moment, but uh, the kinds of purchases made and recorded in the bill book include uh, ale, which you might expect, candles, uh, capillaires, which are a kind of uh, India rubber pipe used to, um, to connect beer pumps to barrels, um, uh, coffee, forgive me, um, coffee, currants, loaves of sugar, flour, fresh meat and vegetables, um, but also improvements to the building and gardens like repainting, new planting and so on. Um, all these bills are made out to Messrs uh, Ellis and Cobb, who were the proprietors of the Yorkshire Stingo from the beginning of 1811 uh, to approximately 1816, according to Sun Alliance insurance records held in the London Metropolitan Archive. Um, and what we're trying to do here is, is read this very quotidian material culture of, of, of the metropolis, in this case, London, for evidence of the colonial project. And that's quite a subtle thing to do. Um, we don't, you know, as is sometimes the case in the country house, have 
conspicuous or exotic materials like shell or feathers um, or radically different forms and forms and motifs to mark out a corpus of material. Um, and so my question here is how we can see the structuring of colonial labour um, into the everyday leisure of the lower and middling sorts of 19th century England. Um, this is a period when intoxicants such as tea, coffee, sugar and tobacco are really ubiquitous in the lifestyles of many and perhaps even the majority of those occupying London. Um, and the material cultures around that, that, those cons that consumption, are finally um, and subtly perpetuated to support it, um, co-opting additional products such as mahogany in the process um, to furnish establishments like public houses, tea gardens, um, and so on, which have been seen to be so central to the social life of Britain at the time. Um, interestingly, uh, we see some of that uh, imperial character in uh, the page of the bill book that I've selected here. Uh, so so um, uh, Hedges and Chamberlain, the distillers and porters um, who have issued the bill, you can see on the um, uh, bottom, lower left hand corner of the book here, um, they are using this, uh, this picture of a kind of Fortuna or Britannia type uh, woman, which I've, I've pulled out in the inset uh, rather blurrily, I'm afraid, um, with uh, ships heading out to sea and barrels at her feet. Uh, so the, already at this point in the supply chain, as it were, before we even reach the consumer, um, just between the publican and the, the, the distiller, um, we can see symbols of empire being invoked here. Um, the other thing that is really important about this bill book and the timing of it is that um, May 1811 also saw the Slave Trade Felony Act receive royal assent. Um, and that was the act that, uh, that shifted uh, participation in the slave trade into the realm of criminal courts um, as opposed to civil ones. Uh, it was previously a kind of um, uh, subject to very prohibitive fines, uh, but from, from 1811 onwards, um, it becomes uh, genuinely uh, illegal and the subject of prison sentences to participate in the slave trade. And so much of this uh, produce from colonies is coming in at a time when the kind of economic model on which um, it's, it's being produced is changing. And I think that's quite important to remember. Um, before we get into the detail, I did want to just uh, situate uh, the Yorkshire Syngo and locate it. Um, so our focus is um, on a single place and you need to know a bit about it. Um, the Yorkshire Stingo at this point sits in the red square on the left hand side of the screen um, and this is a map of, uh, drawn between 1792 and 99 um, and you can see it's on the rapidly developing western edge of London in this period. It has links uh, to the metropolis's developing transport network, um, uh, coaching at this time and also proximity to the canal network um, and also uh, of relevance to this study the Yorkshire Stingo was the site of the distribution of arms to London's Black Poor in the years 1786 and 1787. So not in the grand scheme of things, a terribly long time uh, prior to the period in which we see the bill book. Um, and the Yorkshire Stingo continued to exist, just to note its life after uh, where I'm looking at it. It did continue to exist in various different built forms um, it, through the 19th and into the 20th century in an increasingly urbanized setting. Um, before being demolished in uh, 1969, where around the turn of the 19th century, as you can see here, um, in the second inset on the right hand side, there's a bowling green adjacent to the pub, which is just right in the centre of this picture. Um, and uh, in fact, if I shift to this next slide, um, you do at least finally get an indication of what this establishment looks like. Um, so this is the Yorkshire Stingo, painted in about, uh, drawn in about 1770 and represented here in 1830 as a slightly, I think, bucolic imagining uh, of a tea garden. Um, and you'll see uh, that in the inset picture here, you can see there is a kind of slight, the, the map maker has given an indication of some formal gardens immediately behind the building, as well as a bowling, bowling green adjacent to it. Um, and if you look closely, the sign above the gate uh, in this image does say tea garden. And so there is already an indication of the kinds of colonial commodities that are being consumed here. Um, and uh, there's evidence of kind of displays and entertainments taking place in this tea garden from at least uh, 1790, um, when a scale model of an iron bridge designed by none other than uh, Thomas Paine of Rights of Man fame 
uh, was displayed in the gardens for a year in the hope of attracting investment to build a full-size version across the Skykill River in Philadelphia. And I do think there's something also in that uh, connection to, to a kind of vocal anti-slavery uh, campaigner um, and also to Philadelphia as a centre of emancipation that, that needs to be exploring, explored down the road. Um, so moving on to what was actually in the bill book and how it, um, how it presents when analysed. Um, there's a, there is a small Weller Man joke somewhere in this slide that you might get. Um, and again, probably not the last one you're going to hear this conference. Um, so the rum in question features as one big purchase of 69 gallons in uh, January of final Jamaica rum um, uh, from that same, uh, same distiller that we saw before. Um, and I've put the tea, uh, coffee and sugar orders from the first three months of March 18, uh, of 1811 uh, into this chart here. So you can see the overall uh, picture of uh, really vast volumes of sugar, um, um, uh, which is impressive. And I'm very keen to learn more about uh, why there was so much sugar and what was happening with it, um, but also pretty regular uh, orders here to a local uh, tea, coffee and sugar merchant of, uh, of uh, different kinds of tea, uh, Haisong and Souchong um, and uh, coffee as well. Um, so Lizzie Collingham in her book, uh, which we'll talk more about in a moment, uh, Hungry Empire has pointed to colonial commodities, especially sugar, um, as a key driver of changing shopping habits. And uh, one thing that's also notable when you examine the, the orders in the bill book um, is that the, the orders are very regular. They're approximately weekly, particularly for these tea, uh, tea sugar, coffee, um, products. Um, and John Stobar in his work on grocery retailing period has also highlighted a significant level of consumer literacy um, in where quite specific commodities such as the Sushong, Sushong and Haisong teas we can see here come from. Um, and this raises the question for me of how far the patrons of the Yorkshire Stingo consuming this tea might have made similarly informed choices. Um, and so that's kind of where the research is at. So we'll move on now to a few um, bits of methodology that I'm hoping to apply in the coming months. So um, I am looking at uh, the kind of uh, public house history methodology coined first by Peter Clark and then by um, Paul Jennings, um, which uses a kind of potpourri of uh, regulatory and uh, diary sources, uh, licensing calendars, newspapers, court records, um, as well as business records like this bill book. Um, but I do want to bring into that um, material culture because I think it, it, it offers the opportunity to bring us far closer to individual experience um, and uh, I think that's really um, that's really important when we're talking about the pub. Um, forgive me I'm rushing to keep to time a bit um, but there is also this question of narratives and experience here um, and so um, I, you know, one of the things that I, I, I want to bring to the study when it's published is uh, drawing together of a kind of wide range of sources, material and documentary to communicate big stories, but accessibly. Um, and, and I think there's been some great work done doing that um, uh, in the space of a kind of single person's experience or a single family's experience. So, for example, Lizzie Collingham's book, The Hungry Empire, which you can see on the left hand side here, um, starts uh, by introducing different food stuffs or different food consumption practices um, through uh, individual vignettes. So her first one is in fact the consumption of uh, salt cod on the Mary Rose the night before it sank. Um, and this salt cod has been shopped by Portuguese fishermen in Icelandic waters before being sold to the British Navy at Bristol. And so she goes from there into uh, the significance of all of that um, uh, and the kind of historical data behind it. Um, which I think could be a really powerful methodology, uh, given the, the kind of single setting I've got in the form of the um, Yorkshire Stingo. Um, looking again to John Stobart for that kind of literacy of the consumer um, uh, in the different ranges of products that are becoming available at this time. Um, and I think th uh, that using this method of kind of narrative experience, um, also respects the fact that this work does lie in quite close proximity to the archive of uh, the archive and history of slavery um, and and historic injustice. 
Um, so Sadia Hartman's approach, um, Critical Fabulation, published in Small Acts in 2007, um, both highlights the violence of colonial archives on their enslaved subjects and methodically identifies the gaps between the, quote, legal records, surgeons' journals, ledgers, ships' manifests, and captains' logs um, that, that make up that archive um, and use uh, imaginative narrative techniques to fill those gaps with the speculative experience of the exploited and enslaved. Um, and I'd like to... Um, Sorry, um, Magnus, um, can you start to wrap up with... Absolutely, us? I'm one yes. slide away. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and I just want to explore the value of uh, using that technique in understanding the experience of uh, exploited labour that's taking place around the Yorkshire Stingo um, and the commodities in it. Uh, so this last slide just has a few um, uh, next steps or next directions for the research here. Um, so populating the Yorkshire Stingo and actually understanding some of the biographies of individuals who were in it, uh, following some of these commodities back to where they were produced and looking at more of that history of retail, um, accounting for the impact of abolition and abolitionism, which is clearly linked to the story of the site um, and, you know, looms very large at the time. And then finally, looking at the role of intoxication in all this. Intoxicants are uh, modifiers of perception um, and where we're talking about difference or uh, similarity, um, I think allow accounting for their um, uh, role is very important. Um, so I'll leave that there for now and um, look forward to questions at the end.